we begin today by correcting another omission. In last week's show, I glossed over another one of Chris Crawford's great creations, a balance of power. It was, in a way, a predecessor to the grand strategy genre. The game put you in charge of either the USSR or the USA, and your objective was that of expanding your influence and dominating over the AI-controlled opponent, but without direct confrontation. If war broke out and the nukes started flying, the game was over. It was a game meant to be both engaging and have a point, much like Ultima 4 did that very same year, and for that it must be remembered, even though I've done it a week later than I should have. With that covered, let's begin the year proper. 1986, when mad cow disease was first identified and continues to be a problem to this day, the year when millions of people across the world looked up to the skies and watched in terror as the dream of space died with the Challenger shuttle explosion, though there is still some hope with the launch of the Mir space station by the USSR. Though if there is one event relating to the USSR that people were aware of in that year, it was what happened on the 26th of April. The nuclear power plant outside of Pripyat had a catastrophic malfunction during a safety test, leading to what today we call the Chernobyl disaster. The explosion and fallout from it affected the lives of millions of people, all living under the shadow of an irradiated cloud caused by incompetence and more incompetence. Don't drink the water, is what we were told in the days following the disaster. Don't go outside, they said, and hope it passes soon. But decades later, we still feel its effects. Moving on to less depressing things, 1986 marked the release of the first commercial RISC-based workstation from IBM, a machine that could do fewer things overall, but the things it could do were accomplished with a higher level of performance than a normal CPU that did a lot more things, just not as well. It was the year when we got the ancestor of the laptop in the form of another IBM device, the PC Convertible, that is notable for weighing a little under 6 kilograms unlike the gigantic portable machines of yesteryear, it also was the first computer, commercial at least, to feature an integrated 3.5 inch floppy drive. This was truly the future. The Apple II GS was also released at this time, giving a color GUI to Apple II fans that had yet to embrace the Macintosh. This was actually one of the last few new, and quotation marks, machine we would get for quite a while. The computing boom was crystallized, the winners were picked, and in just a few years, most machines would be IBM compatible x86 computers. Yes, we would still get slightly weak and slightly improved versions of computers already on the market, but with a few exceptions in the workstation category and the Macintosh line that really didn't do much until the mid-90s, this was it. We went from having so many choices to it being made for us. In games, however, diversity was blooming. New companies arose like Acclaim, Ubisoft, Bethesda, Codemasters, a few hardware makers too like Biostar, MSI and Gigabyte, if you're wondering how old the companies making your motherboards are. The Pixar that we know appeared this year, Activision even bought Infocom that had been struggling recently due to its less than stellar foray into the database market, so if you ever wonder why Zork is Activision property, that's why. The arcade scene gave us classics like Outrun, one of Sega's greatest creation of the age. The game stood out for its excellent presentation, a soundtrack that you could customize or you could choose from, and for the general mood of it. Driving into the horizon in a seemingly endless race would be what people identified with the racing game genre for the next few years. You can just about see its DNA even in the most modern arcade racing games, and not in the sense that they are in arcades, but their mechanics are more in tune to simplistic representations with arcade physics, if you will. The famous arcade game Rampage about monsters tearing down buildings was released this very same year, and by coincidence it got turned into a movie in 2018 with not very good results. We also got one of the quintessential beat-em-ups in the form of Renegade from Technos Japan, the direct predecessor to the beloved Kunio-kun series as well as the Double Dragon series, popularizing knees to the face, headbutting and general ass-kicking in urban environments with whips, chains and a lot of leather. 
John Van Gunnigan released New World Computing's first game this year, the classic Might and Magic 1, The Secret of the Inner Sanctum, a game that by today's standards and frankly even by those of the age up to that point was a bit clunky but expanded on the first person dungeon crawling RPG experience with its own brand of craziness, the most notable of which was that although it was a fantasy role playing game for the most part with sorcerers and paladins, it all takes place on a giant ship hurling through space on a mission to colonize distant worlds and seed them with life. One of my biggest regrets is that the Might & Magic series lost that craziness in the past few decades. If you wanted space without the hassle of gnome vampires though, then on the PC you would find fantastic sci-fi classics like Space Quest 1, the Sarian Encounter from Sierra Online and two guys from Andromeda, Mark Crow and Scott Murphy, a parody of Star Wars, Star Trek and generally every sci-fi thing you could find at the time. And he would be playing a nameless janitor out to save the galaxy. His name will be determined in later games to be that of Roger Welko, Hero of the Universe. But if you wanted to sink your teeth into something a bit more consistent, then you had Starflight. Created by Binary Systems in three years, published by Electronic Arts, and beloved by many, it was a space exploration game that didn't go the way of the Elite with you alone in a ship, but instead it aimed more towards Star Trek. You had your ship, you had a crew with your ship, and you went around the galaxy exploring around 800 procedurally generated systems, discovering new worlds, meeting new species, and probably running away from space squids. Starflight was a very influential game, inspiring many other titles in the future, including the superb Star Control series. They even had a few common developers, but we'll get to that in a few weeks. As beautiful as those games were, without a doubt, this year belonged to the consoles. Not only the NES, but the new Sega Master System as well, that was just now being released in the US, with games like Alex Kidd and Miracle World. Maybe not exactly the most memorable game of the platform, you wouldn't get that until a certain hedgehog started making the rounds and a few RPGs made their ways to it. Owners of the Nintendo Entertainment System, however, had their hands full. And I'm not just talking about the excellent Adventure Island the port of the game Wonder Boy from the arcade that had you skateboarding over snails, a game that we can all agree was rad, tubular and extreme before it was cool in the 90s, though technically 720 degrees also was ahead of the curve, an arcade game where you would skate around or die. You can probably thank it for the rise of titles like the Tony Hawk series, though I'm willing to bet that Tony Hawk had a bit of a say in that too. Coming back to the NES, one of the most influential RPGs of Japan came out in 1986. That was Dragon Quest, or Dragon Warrior as it was known in the US back then, molding itself after Wizardry and Ultima with a few personal touches from Chunsoft and game designer Yuji Hori. It is one of the most influential titles of its time, in Japan at least. It is the reason why the JRPG genre exists. If it wasn't for it, for its success, certain other studios would have probably gone belly up and would have never created genre-defining titles that are still being talked about today and are still getting new releases constantly. And Dragon Quest itself is still getting sequels. And the platform got a couple of other games that, combined, would with time define another genre, the Metroidvania. Though technically the Vania part would not be valid for a few more years at its fullest. Castlevania was one of Konami's greatest achievements of that age, a great action game where you would fight ghostly apparitions, annoying bats, the undead and even Dracula himself using your wits, crosses, holy water, whips, chains, all while dressed in leather. It was the start of the time. You would also rob his castle in the process and somehow find edible food hidden in the walls. Vampires were sneaky like that. Alongside it we had Metroid, a breakthrough title for its time, not pictured here to avoid copyright issues. A side scroller that wasn't about going in a single direction and it wasn't just about blowing up your enemies. You did it all with style, with a bit more effort than usual. You had to explore complex levels by making full use of your powers, 
Finding secret caches of weapons and upgrades, unlocking the full potential of Samus Aran, running around levels you already listed again, so that you could find new things with the stuff you just unlocked. Then you would be fighting a pterodactyl, you'd be fighting some crazy space pirates, you'd be destroying Mother Brain and doing a lot of stuff in between. Metroid had a great sense of mood to it, taking inspiration from the likes of Valian, though it was a bit undersold by the mostly upbeat theme it had. That would be fixed with time in the sequels. And let's not forget, Metroid starred one of the longest running female main characters in a mainstream action game, which you would think was also valid for the next game, but that just ended up causing a lot of confusion. The Legend of Zelda, also not pictured here due to copyright issues, was another of Shigeru Miyamoto's greatest accomplishments, a game with a similar design philosophy to Super Mario Bros. Easy to understand, easy to get, but with more of an emphasis on exploration. It's been often called an RPG, but it doesn't really fit that mold any more than Metroid does, since there is no emphasis on gaining experience or improving statistics, and apart from gaining more health, there really isn't any permanent enhancement that you make to your character. Regardless of that, The Legend of Zelda was a fantastic game, one that rewarded careful exploration, resilience to killing the same respawning enemies again and again and again, and navigating dungeons with challenging boss fights. The Legend of Zelda is as synonymous with Nintendo as are the Super Mario Bros and copyright abuse. It also made a lot of people confuse the main character, Link, for the titular Zelda. The objective being, of course, that of finding the Triforce, beating Ganon, and then rescuing Zelda. Though she would be playable in some future iterations of the franchise, not necessarily the main series itself. I know I'm skipping over a bunch of games from 1986, but the list is getting so long that it is a bit difficult to cram more of them in, which is why I'd like to thank Aliancher for posting a list of the other games in the comment section in the videos of the past weeks. As for what was the game of 1986, I would say that was Dragon Quest. It can't be glossed over how pivotal it was to bringing RPGs to consoles. And let's face it, the PC ones are fantastic, Ultima, Wizardry, they are marvels, but they have issues with their ease of use. But on a console with limited controls, there needed to be a streamlining of the process of playing them, and yes, that meant more limited interaction going back to what the genre was maybe a decade earlier, but it still brought the RPG to many who would have not experienced it otherwise, and it did it with the graphics of 1986. And because it was a success, because the recipe worked, it proved that it could be profitable, RPGs on consoles became viable, they spread, they became the norm. It would not have happened without Dragon Quest. And that is why it is the game of 1986. See you next time. Goodbye.